I will share that it was several years ago with the support of a Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund grant that Dr. Verna Yu and I were in a position to invite David Diamond to work with our faculty and residents uh, during two weekend long workshops that took place a year apart. Um, with, with the support of the Office of the Vice Dean uh, Education, Dr. Fraser Brenneis, David is indeed currently a visiting theater director affiliated with the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine program in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. He is the recipient of numerous awards. Um, in 2010, he was honored to travel with the Governor General of Canada, Michel Jean, as a Canadian delegate in, Af in Africa. Um, he is also the author of the award-winning book, Theatre for Living, the Art and Science of Community-Based Dialogue, which has a foreword by the renowned systems theorist, Fritjof Capra. Um, although Theatre for Living, which David is the artistic director, is situated in Vancouver, David is truly a citizen of the world. Uh, he has, his career has followed a fascinating journey which has led him to join with people in many communities and countries who are interested in engaging in constructive social change and engaged dialogue. Interestingly, of course, part of his journey has, uh, part, of it, part of the beginning of it actually occurred here at the University of Alberta where David received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Department of Drama. And it has followed many, many paths. We'll hear some of those paths which have involved Alberta, um, including the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, but also his recent uh, tour that was funded by AHS, Maladjusted, uh, that David will be in part talking about today. So would you all please join with me in welcoming David Diamond. Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you here in the theater. And I understand there's a whole bunch of you watching across BC and Alberta, maybe in other places. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's an honor to be here for the John Dossiter Health Ethics Series. The title of this is Humanizing Medicine Going Off Script. And so I'm um, going to not use this as much as humanly possible. Um, but I've been asked really to talk about uh, Maladjusted, a uh, uh, big touring production that just finished, and the work here in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, this talk, uh, because I'm a theater director and I need to do this, is timing out at about 35 minutes. I need to know what I'm doing, and uh, so I'll do that. There'll be slide images in the midst of it, and then there will be time for discussion here in the room and from outside, I imagine. Launching in, though, I think it's really important to give you a context about where this work comes from and where I'm coming from. Um, Theatre for Living grew out of the work of a man named Augusto Boal, a Brazilian theater director, founder of the Theater of the Oppressed. Boal started off as a mentor of mine, became a colleague and a very, very dear friend. Boal passed away a number of years ago, and it became necessary about 15 years ago to change the name of what I was doing from Theater of the Oppressed to Theater for living very briefly that involved understanding that the binary model that Theater of the Oppressed was working in was not helping the communities that were inviting me to come work with them, that they needed something more uh, holistic, more systems-based that didn't criminalize certain members of their communities. And that really challenged me to rethink how I see the world. Um, and so the name changed from Theatre of the Oppressed to Theatre for Living. I have a core belief, and that is that communities are larger living organisms. In the same way that our bodies are made up of cells and make the living organism of our body, communities are made up of people that make up the living organism of the community. 
And in the same way that people need to express themselves or they get sick, I hope we know that, that if we just keep it all bottled up inside us, eventually we get sick. Communities need to express themselves or they get sick. The way communities used to express themselves was through song, dance, drama, a primal language that belongs to all of humanity, not only those who normally get to stand in the light. But recently, in the evolution of humankind, that activity has become commodified, along with everything else. And so now we buy music, we buy dance, we buy movies, we buy plays. We pay strangers to tell us stories about strangers. And when do we get together as living communities to use this language, art, that belongs to all of us? Not to tell her story or his story, but our collective stories. The answer is, we don't. And in the same way that people get sick when they can't express themselves, communities get sick. I think the proof of that is everywhere we look. So why is theater or art a good mechanism to do this with communities? It's because we humans, we don't think in words. We think in pictures. We think in images. If I say to you, fire, I doubt very much that you see F-I-R-E. You see a picture. Uh, flames, bullets coming out of a gun, something. We think in pictures. Theater is a language of image. And it's the reason it is powerful. What creates uh, transformation in an individual or in a community? It is that moment of being pushed off balance. And then as the organism tries to regain equilibrium, decisions have to be made. It either ends up exactly where it was before, or it ends up somewhere else. That's the transformative process. It's the learning process of being knocked off balance, or even knocking oneself off balance, and regaining equilibrium. Art is a really wonderful vehicle for doing that. It is, I want to suggest to you, the function of art is to challenge us, is to show us ourselves and the world through different kinds of eyes. It is perspective changing. And so what happens is invitations come to enter living communities and use the language of the theater. I'm a theater director. If I was a visual artist, it'd be a murals, or a dancer, it'd be dance. I'm a theater guy. And use the language of the theater to help communities tell their collective stories about issues that they are having a very difficult time talking about. Um, there have been many projects over the years uh, with refugees, with gang members, with street kids, projects on the legacy of residential school issues, family violence in various forms, suicide, racism, homelessness, corporate messaging and globalization. Uh, last year, a project with human rights activists and mining executives. The list is very, very long. And I want to talk a little bit about the ethics of this, just because we are where we are. And it really is a, a case of people who are living the issues. These aren't professional actors. Although I sometimes work with professional actors who are living the issues. In the theater work, we are not doing therapy. I'm a theater director. I'm not a therapist. We're not doing psychodrama. It's very powerful work. But it's not what I'm doing. You'll see in the images, I'll talk about this a little bit, we're working with the consciousness of the larger community. We're not focused on the individual. The person doesn't come into the process to have breakthroughs in the work. 
That happens off the side of the table all the time. But the person comes into the process because they have knowledge. So we're working with street kids, and they have tremendous knowledge that other people don't have. And that knowledge is honored throughout a theatrical process so that we can give a gift to the larger community from people who have real expertise. So we're creating fictions. Nobody's playing themselves. We're not putting anybody's personal life on the stage. We're creating fictions that tell the truth. And if we're in very uh, intense circumstances, issues on family violence, that sort of stuff, there are support people in the room who are culturally appropriate to deal with other stuff that might bubble up, that happen adjacent to the theater process. And we can talk about that more when we get to, uh, and I'll also explain some of it when we get to the slide images. I want to talk about Maladjusted, created and performed by mental health patients and caregivers. Actually, the Maladjusted image could come up now. Uh, how did Maladjusted come into being? Um, the theater company is 34 years old. We have always done plays on social justice issues. And because of that, we have relationships with a lot of social service agencies, many of them in the health sector. We started hearing from people about the difficulty they were having with how mechanized the mental health system had become. Caregivers couldn't give the care they wanted to give. Patients couldn't get the care they felt they needed. We thought this was really good subject matter for a main stage project. Why? Because this exists kind of under the surface. There's a lot of talk out there about mental health and stigmatization. But this wasn't about that. This was about how the system that we've created isn't working anymore. That we are all of us being asked to adjust to a maladjusted mental health system. And so as we would always do, we sent word out that we were looking for people who were living the issues to be involved directly in the creation and the performance of the play. Just under 200 applications came in. We had to process all of those, and we boiled it down to 24 people, including the cast of six, who participated in a week-long theater for living workshop. Six days, eight hours a day, using theater techniques to investigate these issues of our struggles with mechanization inside their lives. And so here are some images from that workshop. We have permission, of course, to use these images. Oh, actually, no. First, this is, uh, you know, the, the interviews have been done. We know who the workshop participants are. We know who the cast is. And we need promotional shots because interviews and all that stuff have to start. But we don't have a play yet. But we know what the play's about. So working with a very talented photographer, David Cooper, this emerged. And it really spoke to the uh, content of the, some of the content of the production, and is a very provocative image. I like it for that. It got used really a lot, and really brought people, because they understood this, into the production. Uh, this is the workshop group. As you can see, a very, very diverse group of people. Courageous group. And so we're working in a language of image. My invitation to people is to offer moments, yes, out of their own lives, when they're struggling somehow with this issue of mechanization. But I'm not interested in our exploration of the image in the details of the image maker's moment. In fact, they're not allowed to explain it. What I'm interested in is our relationship and our perceptions of those moments. Because that's, it's the linkages of all of us in the room and how we relate to this image that is going to create the content of the play. And so what starts to happen as people understand this is that it becomes a very safe space to offer a very intimate moment but never have it poked and prodded at. 
and people learn tremendous things. The image makers learn a lot about other people's perceptions of this thing they've put up, things that we never need to know. Uh, and so there are images, very courageous images being made that are helping us understand the complexity of the story that is going to emerge out of our work. And now we are in rehearsal. So the workshop takes a week. Um, and now we are just with the cast. And we're continuing to work in images for a little while, but no longer about content. This is now all about character. These people, all of them living the issues, have to develop characters that sit beside them. Nobody's playing themselves. But they've, because it's going to be forum theater, and I'm going to explain that in a bit, in a bit they've got to play characters they understand really, really well. How are these characters interrelated? What are the relationships? What are the character histories? This is what creates good theater. And so we're trying to create something that is character driven, not plot driven, particularly because it's going to be interactive theater and people are going to be stepping into it. And so what we're doing here is we're understanding the relationships between these developing characters and each other. And that is going to give us the narrative, the story. Pen never goes to paper in this process. There is no playwright. It all emerges out of improvisational work that starts with these frozen images and our explorations of them. Um, and so we have three weeks. And after the three weeks, Maladjusted is ready to perform. Maladjusted had three storylines, three threads. Um, and I want to explain them to you before I show you the next images. There is Danny, a 17-year-old girl and her mother. Um, Danny uh, is very sad. Her best friend killed herself a year ago. Danny's in mourning, and she can't get through it. And she's also 17, <laughs> and she's acting out in all kinds of ways. There are lots of arguments, there's lots of slamming of doors. This happens with teenagers, if we recall. And her mom, Mia, has her own issues and is fed up with this. Mia wants her daughter fixed. And she takes her to a psychologist who does some questionnaires, sends her to a psychiatrist who does some questionnaires. And in a very short interview, Danny is declared bipolar and put on very heavy medication. Not only was this story very close to the young woman's story who was playing the role, but was also the same story as three other participants in the workshop. That's four people out of 24. And when I would ask audiences how many of them recognize the truth of this story, 80, 90% of the hands would go up in the audience. So we know that this is happening uh, just really a lot out there. The other thread is Jack, a young homeless guy who is trying to get off the street and he can't. There's nowhere for him to go. And, the, you know, the nightly shelters are not a solution for him. His social worker finds a place. There is a bed open. It is unfortunately in an addiction recovery house. This is not what Jack needs. He needs a home. It's the wrong place for him. But it's all that's available. And he agrees to go. He is legitimately on anti-anxiety meds. And protocols being what they are, at his intake, they take his meds away. And it takes two and a half days for the resident doctor, because it's Friday, to okay these meds. And in that time period, Jack goes sideways. He's off his meds. And he runs away, and very bad things happen to Jack, because he's been in the wrong place. And again, when I would ask audiences uh, if this is true, is it the case in the community that we're in on this tour that we've done this tour 
Well, I'll, I'll talk about the tour in a moment. 80, 90% of the hands would go up. Yes, in our community, somebody needs A, only B is available. B is the wrong thing. But they're getting B anyway, because it's all there is, and it's harmful. And it's part of the mechanization of the system. And then the third thread is the professionals in the story who did not enter medicine to deal with budget cuts and staff shortages and burnout. And there was a tremendous amount of compassion for these characters from audiences. They get it. They get that the people who are their caregivers are burning out. And they don't know what to do about it. But they get it. And so we've been looking here at the set. Uh, we work with a professional design team. It's very important to me that we are touring professional theater. This isn't some little skit that's touring around. Why is that important to me? Because it is, it's, it's the art that trans, that's transformational. My worst case scenario is an audience being at one of these shows and leaving and going, oh, that was really good considering who was doing it. Mental health patients and caregivers. I want them to walk out the door going, that was amazing. Because it is the power of the art and how it reaches inside the community. It's not the good intentions of the project that create the transformational power. And so here we now have images of the production. Dr. Devereaux. And you should know this guy, whose name is really Pierre, was a psychiatrist who left the profession because he was so angry about the very issues in the play. He heard about the project, he went, oh, that's for me, and he ended up in the play, and he brought a great depth of experience, for obvious reasons, into this production. Dr. Devereaux swimming in numbers. Danny and Mia having a good moment, because it's going to get heavy soon enough. Mia pushing Danny in a not a good way to talk about Amy, her friend. This, of course, leads to all kinds of yelling and screaming. <laughs> and the plot of the play opens up. Jack and Frank, Jack is at his intake in uh, the recovery house, and Frank, the worker, is going through his stuff in a very intrusive way. This is, in fact, what happens. There are reasons for it, and his meds get taken away. Jack is by now signed the contract. Here's a piss jar, I want a piss test from you. Jack is realizing he might have made a big mistake. He's going to be off his meds in uh, a dorm with seven other guys off his anti-anxiety medication. He can't do this. Uh, we're in the diagnosis. Dr. Devereaux is explaining to Danny the diagnosis and the list of medications that he's putting her on. Jack has run away. He's run into Frank. Frank is out looking for him in the street. Uh, they meet each other, and this scene ends in violence. Jack, who is in a state by now, attacks Frank physically. Jack in the street. And he, of course, encounters Danny, because we're making a piece of theater, and the characters all interact. They meet each other over a cigarette, and they share some time in a back lane. And they played a lovely scene together, where audiences, audiences got this. These two see each other. They could help each other if circumstances were very different. What happens is Danny picks up a shard of glass. They're sitting in the street in, in, in a back lane. And Jack says to her, you know, I would clean that before I use it. And she says, what, what the hell are you talking about? And he starts to show her his scars from cutting. That really freaks her out. <laughs> and she runs away. But she takes the shard with her. It, it's not a big moment for her. She just picked up this thing. Uh, he follows her home. Because he's found a connection with somebody. It's not an evil moment. People don't talk to Jack. He's homeless. And he's off his meds. Danny gets home. Mia is in a state. Mia is cleaning up a storm. This isn't just any kind of cleaning. Danny has to calm her mother down. 
we see the relationship in a much deeper way. Danny becomes the parent. Frank has arrived. Frank is her uncle. Um, Mia's brother-in-law. And, of course, Jack has followed her home. All the worlds start to collide. Chaos happens. Jack wants a connection with Danny. She's 17. Frank goes ballistic. Because he knows Jack. Jack just wanted to give her lighter back. This leads to a huge fight that Danny hears from her bedroom. This image is something I'm very fond of. The set does this. This is the, the wonderful job of the set designer. These two are in separate worlds and yet connected. Frank goes back uh, to the clinic. He's desperate for his meds. They're locked up at the, at the recovery house. He can't get them. He's hoping that uh, Abby, his worker, can get him meds. All she can do is take him to emergency. He's not going to go there. They're going to just strap him to a bed and inject him. He knows that. Um, Frank comes to the clinic. Jack freaks out. He attacks Abby. And that leads to this. He gets injected against his will. The worst case scenario for him. The final moment in the play is a slide that we don't have. We move back to Danny alone in her bedroom. And she cuts for the first time. And this play ends. Um, we're going to just rest here on this slide for a bit. Um, because this isn't just any kind of theater. This is forum theater. Um, just let me explain the slides. So you're not just staring at it and wondering what it is. This is actually a slide from the closing night. There's much, many more people on the stage who've been involved in the project. And it's the finish of the tour. Uh, I just want to rest there while I, ex I, I explain what forum theater is. This play builds to a crisis and it stops. It offers no solutions. It's as if the play turns around and says, we have this, these real issues that we're struggling with and we really don't know what to do. What do we do? You show the play once, it's about half an hour long, and then you perform it again. The second time the audience gets to yell, stop, if they understand the struggles that the characters are engaged in. And they have an idea about how, in this case, to humanize the care in this mechanized system to humanize it in the individual, in the family, in the system. They yell, stop, come out of the audience, onto the stage, replace the character whose struggle it is they understand, and try their idea. The other actors improvise with them in character. This is why it's essential that they are people really living the issues. Otherwise, they're just making stuff up, and that would be highly irresponsible. And so they're drawing off of a life of knowledge as these characters. And so audience members come and they try ideas to humanize care. And there's tremendous learning that's happening in the room. Not just from uh, ideas that succeed, but often from ideas that don't go the way the audience member thought they might go. Uh, uh, because there's tremendous insight in that. My job in it is to make sure nobody leaves the stage embarrassed or defeated. There are things to learn in absolutely every idea that comes to the stage. Um, and so this play toured. You know, Maladjusted went very well in Vancouver, and uh, so much so that requests came to tour. Uh, it took a year and a half to raise the money and uh, book what we just finished in the end of March, which was 28 shows in 26 communities across BC and Alberta. It's a lot of work. And one of the things that was really good about the booking of the tour was that we insisted we can do this, that the show came into communities and was co-sponsored by Native and non-Native health organizations. Why? 
because the issue doesn't understand the boundaries that we communities have created between us. And we want diverse audiences in the room. And they won't, because of historical context that I'm sure we all understand, will not necessarily come to each other's events. The, the organizations aren't even working together. And so this is us being an, not just a theater company, but an activist theater company. And in bringing this outside thing in that is about something they all share with a native and non-native cast, it is integral. Relationship building happens between organizations that exist long after the project is over. Um, and so through the Forum Theatre, there's a lot of uh, human learning going on. And as I'm sure you can imagine, people are learning things about their own lives, and their own situations, and their own families that they take out of the theater that nobody needs to know anything about. There are support people in the room if people need them. Uh, but how do you create systemic change? And so there was, an, there was another layer to this. There were scribes at every performance, local scribes, people whose job it was to take notes about the ideas that were coming onto the stage. Not notes about the people, but notes about the ideas. Because some of those ideas were desires for policy changes in various levels of health care. Um, and so the scribes took all these notes, took them home, and came up with policy documents, which were suggestions for filling holes in policy, shifts in policy, new policies that were specific to the local community we were in, because the stuff that came up in St. Paul was very different than the stuff that came up in Calgary. Those uh, policy documents are just now coming into our office. There are local agencies who have agreed to receive them, and Alberta Health Services will also be getting them. I just had a meeting with Alberta Health Services yesterday. They will be following up in the local communities to see if these suggestions are being followed up on, and will be taking those policy documents, once the election is over, into the legislature. The same thing will be happening in BC. Um, and you know, I'm not naive. Policy shifting is difficult. I think there will be things that happen at a local level. It's harder to have that happen with government. I get it. But there is an opportunity here because policy like this usually happens from the top down and very often it is meaningless. This is a chance for it to be from the grassroots up. It's not me who came up with this idea. I want to be clear. Augusta Boal pioneered legislative theater. This is an adaptation of it in a way. But we... It, it is an opportunity that I think could be very interesting. And the last thing about Maladjusted, this evening that you're seeing here, this final thing was also the webcast, the global webcast. We get to do this with our big projects. And so this one show webcast live to the planet. People from all over the world watch. And they not only watch, but they make interventions, just like the audiences do. There's a bank of actors sitting on computers just off stage. And if you want to make an intervention, you enter chat space with one of those actors. They ask you questions, and then they run on the stage and do it for you. Uh, the very first time we did this was from a guy named Sasha in Croatia. Here this night, 30 students in a room in uh, uh, a college in Victoria made a group intervention into the play. This is a remarkable thing to be able to do, and it really increases our reach. So this is maladjusted, and I want to now move into, oh, um, right. Can you really see these? You can, read, can you read that? Can you read these? Because if you can read them, I'm not going to read them out to you. Do you think people who are watching can read these? Yeah? Do you need me to read a couple of these out, or can you just look at them? Uh, um, no, actually, I need to read some of them out because I'm going to go to the next slide. I just realized that. I'm just going to read two of them. Uh, Maladjusted was so well done. I was in tears a few times as the anguish the characters portrayed was palpable. The play gave an opportunity for people who would typically not be engaged to have a voice. And it did so in a very, very real way. No terms of reference, no project charters or work plans, just realistic situations. This is from... Uh, we have permission to use these quotes, of course. Terry Wojtykiew, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, who's a nurse. 
and the one just below that, maladjusted, was very raw and honest. Theater for Living got right to the heart of the issues, which is the exact place we need to start. People working within and participating in the mental health system can quickly feel helpless and powerless, repeated emotions during the showings. However, this play allows people to have a voice, to break it down, reflect, and figure out new ways of thinking and being. Melanie Henning, Aboriginal Health Programs, Alberta Health Services. And just because I'm a theatre director and I like this one, thanks to Theatre for Living's innovative and radical approach to the subject, maladjusted yields, yields cheers along with the tears. Stuart Drayden, who reviewed it for the Vancouver province. And the reason I think that's important is although this is about stuff that's really serious, there is a tremendous amount of laughter in these events. It's not just grim and determined. It is the saving grace. Legitimately funny things happen. There's laughter of recognition. There's laughter of release. And yes, there's also tears. Whole communities crying together. And I have to believe that's healthy. I don't know when laughter got good and crying got bad. That happened somewhere along the line. I am not afraid of people's tears. Um, and so now I want to move into the work here. Let's just go back here so you don't stare at those people you know. Um, uh, while I'm saying this, you can read the rest of these. Um, Pam was the first person to clue into the work, uh, the Theatre for Living work. And she uh, made an invitation for me to come and do a two and a half day workshop. Um, and it went really well just investigating issues inside the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. And so another invitation happened, another two and a half day workshop. And the dean, Dean Miller, uh, came. And I thought he was going to make a speech and leave. <laughs> uh, he came to the first evening session, which was four hours, and he stayed. And he participated in the, four, the first four hours of the session that evening. And out of that, came an invitation to do the theater work inside the faculty uh, to look at cultural shifting around healthy uh, learning environments. And so this first workshop was uh, before the, uh, was that very first workshop, before the invitation got kind of really defined. And what, what we're looking at here is simply issues inside the faculty, inside medicine. And it's of interest to me uh, because the man in blue standing on a broken structure. And I want to say this. This is the case for all of the images, even the ones that you saw from Maladjusted. It's not me saying to people, make image X, Y, or Z. The participants in the workshop are creating images about the things that they feel are important. I'm not... I am not creating any of the images. My job is to facilitate a conversation, uh, both physical conversation and a talking conversation about the images. And so this image was about somebody standing on a broken structure and how that flows down through all levels of medicine to this woman on the floor who we might recognize, who in this image is a patient. This image is about something that has bubbled up in absolutely every workshop I have done here. And that is the culture of silence that permeates the faculty. It's been in every workshop in one way or another. And there's no way that's healthy. People are unable to speak their minds. And it has come up absolutely every time. Uh, this working with graduate studies, I'm not going to explain them all, but of course you can see the stress inside this image. And I will let you interpret th this for yourselves. <laughs> this was created um, for an Alberta Health Services conference. And one of the things that really interested me about it, because it's come up in later conversations, this can be interpreted in many different ways. I'm going to put one interpretation onto it. And that is that there are individuals, medical health professionals, 
who have to make very difficult decisions sometimes about when care might need to end. And how does that person navigate that and not be the villain? This image has a lot of layers to it. It can be interpreted in ways other than what I've just articulated, but this is one of them. This image from just a few days ago, a very courageous image this was, because it was so emotionally engaged. Somebody being pulled at from all sides, and inside that moment, shutting down has tried and tried and tried. And when we talked about this image in the room, and I said to people, who has been this young woman? Every single hand in the room went up. This can't be healthy. And we had a lot of fun with this image, a, a supervisor being Vanna White in a game show, trying to explain this new idea to a staff person who, because she can't speak her mind, and she thinks it's actually a really stupid idea, <laughs> is just going, yup, whatever you say. This also opened up a very important conversation in the room about how we create agency inside a division for people to be creative and for it not just to come from the top down. And so there have been real important conversations that have opened up inside the workshops. And the workshops, for the most part, have been short, one hour, two hour. Uh, there was a day-long thing a couple days ago that was just a pleasure because it takes time to do this work. The one hour and two hour workshops have been valuable, but they're really hard because you're introducing a new language to people. The culture of silence has been discussed. The fact that people are expected to be superhuman and have no way to manage this. There was something that came up, uh, not, not in images, in discussion. A young woman had the courage to say, uh, she's now working in, in, a, in a hospital, on, on a ward, that the only way she has to process her emotions is to go and hide in the broom closet then get herself back together and go back to work. And when I said to people in the room, 30 some odd people, how many of you understand in your own life experiences are using either realistically or symbolically the broom closet, almost every single hand in the room went up. This opened up such a conversation about the need to be meeting on an ongoing basis to find a way to process the very heavy emotions, and not do what's happening, which is just swallowing them. It can't be healthy. Um, so, I'm of the opinion now that it's time to take a step forward. We have a chance to create change inside this very large culture that I am actually a visitor to. I've entered a very different culture than the one I live in. I'm learning a lot. The image theater work has been very powerful for people. I think it's time for us now to make plays. They can be very short plays. They could be 60 seconds long. There are enough people who've participated in the work who understand the language that we could do this. Plays about the, the things that are bubbling up. Plays about burnout. Plays about not the broom closet. Plays about uh, uh, agency. Plays about the culture of silence. 60 seconds. And take those plays into hour-long classes. And instead of doing the very symbolic image theater, do forum theater and create cultural shifting. It will do that. But you know, um, I, I'm going to throw an, a very old joke at you that has been popping up lately 
No disrespect to psychiatrists, I've had a few in my life, <laughs> and I respect their work immensely. Some of you will know this joke. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? You know this joke? Yeah? No. The answer is one. But the light bulb has to want to change. And we are at a place. An invitation was made to me to come and do this work. And it's monumental. My request now, and Pam has been making this request, is for help. If you understand the value of this, and I hope I've been able to explain it, and if you also agree, and I'm meeting more and more people who do, who think that this cultural shift is an important thing to have happen in terms of healthy learning environments, my request is to like be the filament in the light bulb that wants to change. Leave this theater, uh, log off after we're done here, and talk this up. Uh, there's a potential here that is great, and it doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with a desire in the faculty of medicine and dentistry. Um, have people contact Pam in, in her office. Invite the work in to the places that you work. Uh, that will be a signal to deepen the process. It's time for us to make plays. Um, I'm going to close this part down now and open the floor up and the lines up, however that happens, for questions or comments, discussion. Thank you for listening. Anybody? Yes. What, uh, what are the venues that you create? Is it just the actual creations or do you create and spin the lab? Uh, yeah. The question is what are the venues that need to be used for this? These would be little skits. They could happen in any classroom I've been in. They could happen. They could happen in lecture halls. They could happen in those, uh, those smaller rooms where the tables are sometimes in a circle. Uh, uh, they, you know, they think they could happen in a high school room classroom in front of the chalkboard, they would be very flexible. They wouldn't need any sets or anything like that. It would be about relationship somehow. Good question. And thank you for breaking the culture of silence in the room. Anybody else? Yeah, well, there are people, uh, this isn't about actors, it's about people in the faculty, and I understand the challenge of this, who could find the time to commit to this. Uh, I think it would need to be people who have come into a workshop somehow, uh, which isn't to say if you wanted to, you couldn't, you'd come into a workshop first somehow. Understand the language a little bit, because that would make the play creation process faster. Uh, they are, the play would be determined by the people who were making it. And so if those people really understood, say, the culture of silence, that's the play we'd make, you know? And I think those plays could be iconic enough, because they're really about relationships, that they could travel into various divisions, different departments. It wouldn't have to be about pediatrics, you know, or graduate, you know what I mean? There are 10 minutes remaining in this video conference session. I, I was warned this would happen. Does that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. it always need to be prearranged, or have you ever considered the flash mob mentality where you surprise people? <laughs> well, there is a, a, um, there's a thing called invisible theater in this work, where uh, things just happen in front of an audience, like you're on a bus, and a racist act occurs that's performed and somebody intervenes and a thing that happens. And I'm not a big fan of it because I think that inside this work that really takes analyzing what's going on, an awareness that you're watching theater is important. 
Otherwise, this is just another racist act on a bus, right? And so um, I think it does need to be prearranged. It's not, uh, I, th there are, the flash mob thing is quite different. It's about performing something big, music and that sort of stuff. This is different. I think this takes uh, permission. It, it, uh, engagement like that is voluntary. Uh, um, we did w one of these, a two hour session uh, with a large group that did not go well. And I think one of the reasons it didn't go well was I walked in and they were trapped in the room. They didn't even know what they were getting. Well, the thinking is that the people that you most want to see it are the ones who would never voluntarily vote. Um, so. Well, I think as word m moves through, but let me put it this way. In Maladjusted, it, in, in this, we were getting people who'd never been to the theater before. There was a buzz on about this thing. And I think once you start to do it and people go, oh, you know that weird theater thing that's going around, it's really interesting, people go. It has to start somewhere. But, but if I'm trying to convince them to engage in something that they're going, why am I here? That's a very different chemistry. Well, the question is, what's the timeline? When will we start performing them? I don't know. We uh, haven't decided to do plays yet. This is me going, I think we need to be making plays now. We haven't decided that that's going to happen. I, I think there's an energy that needs to build. This is me trying to create that energy. I think we need to take the next step. I, let me ask it. Can I ask a question? I, all this takes is the raise of hands. Having heard this, how many people think it would be a good idea to start making plays about this stuff inside the faculty? And if you don't think so, that's okay. I'm not offended, you know. But how many of you think it would be? Can I just see some hands? Like most of the hands in the room are up. Um, so you know. And m my impression from talking to people is that it would have uh, traction. We've just got like five minutes left. Yes. You know, I just want to thank you and congratulate you because I think in terms of what we're trying to do is hone people's ethical sensibility. I think what you clued into is that the rational approach is not always an effective way to deliver the message. We need to learn ways to do it so that it touches people's emotions. Yeah. I'm just going to repeat a little of what you said. That, that, that this uh, gentleman is saying that he uh, thinks that, uh, I'll, I'm going to paraphrase this, that the, that the focus of the work is powerful in that the rational approach does, isn't necessarily what changes an, uh, ethics, that it comes from uh, emotions. And I agree, you can't legislate ethical behavior. You can try, but it, it will never work. That transformation comes from here. And it's the reason, again, that art and theater is a very powerful tool. It's an emotional language. And it's embodied. Let me say this. The thing about forum theater that's powerful is it's really easy for an audience member to sit in their seat and go, what's wrong with them? I know what they should do. This is simple. But it's a very different when they come into the play and enter the complexity of the world that's been created and come up against that, they go, ooh, this is more complicated than I thought it was. And there's, and because they've come out of the audience, the whole audience is walking onto the stage with them. It, it is a very powerful moment. Yeah. 
Yeah, this woman is asking if there's prep work necessary because she works with a lot of introverts and she doesn't think they would do this, just to shorten that. Um, that's, I, it, it's actually a hard thing to explain to people. And it's the reason that I, in fact, don't like the one and two hour sessions. Having a one, hour, a, a one day workshop, there were a lot of introverts in that room. The woman who was uh, in that very intense image uh, and shutting down, I know this, is that person who you would describe. And um, they came uh, because it was a professional development possibility and they were told it was going to be fun and it was going to deal with real things that they're dealing with. And it was fun. And we spent the morning playing games, really particular games. And it was interesting what they said. They said, we heard we were going to play games. I was really dreading that. I didn't want to do that. But you know what? These were The moment we started, these were terrific. And I hear this from people all the time because I work with really silenced communities. I've never been in an environment where I could say the thing I just said for. I can't believe that I'm doing this. And so I'm not, I, I'm not afraid of working with the introverts. I understand what you're saying about getting them in the room. But there's a level at which the more you explain this to them, the harder it's going to be because you can't explain what it's going to be. You know, I, I, do you understand what I'm saying? That, that I think it's, it's the word of mouth. It's talking to people who were in it, who go, you know, I didn't want to go, because this happens all the time. I didn't want to go. It was amazing. Go. Get over it and go. And, and it's that. If you can bring somebody in, here's the thing, you bring somebody in who's been in one of the workshops, who says to the people, I know what you're thinking. I was thinking it too. That's the prep work. Did that answer your question?